There were two people from CBOQ here this past week, and uh, they asked, what are you anticipating when your pastor comes? I had one word, relief. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. A relief, indeed. Is this on, Jim? I think I didn't touch anything on it. Okay. That was always my issue any other time before, too, is... Uh, so I, I do have to press a button, okay. Yeah, I never would do those things. And, uh, it's probably an on switch somewhere. This one, that says mute, but that is power. Is that good? Pardon? No, there's no light on it. That's why I was concerned. A little longer, okay. So you've had two people from the convention come and they asked, and that's all you, all right, that's good, relief. I should have just brought some Pepto-Bismol and some Rub A535 for you then. It would have been a little cheaper than the gas. I mailed it to you. You could have all picked it up at your one mailbox in town. I just learned that yesterday. It's going to be great. No more getting the mail in my pajamas. I'd like to uh, begin by reading the Word of God that we're going to look at uh, today. I think you have outlined for you there in your bulletins the text uh, for us this morning and... <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. We've come, as I shared last time I was here, we've come to hear from God this morning to celebrate and express praise as a congregation to Him. And now we come to hear from Him as well. So let us hear God's holy word as recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. And I want to take us just a little outside of the particular passage from which I want to speak, but to give us that context. Chapter 15, the latter part of verse 13 and onward to 29, 28, sorry. Let us read together. And if we would please stand for the reading of God's word. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone, they are blind guides of the blind, and if one blind person guides yet another, both will fall into the pit. But Peter said then to him, explain this parable to us. And then he said, are you also still without understanding? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, Slander, these are what defile a person. Verse 21. Jesus left that place now and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Thus ends the reading of God's word. The grass withered and the flowers fade, but the word of God lasts forever. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray as we 
come. Father, we come to you this morning to hear from you. We thank you for the words of this interaction, the, that, th that this was captured in Scripture by your evangelist. We thank you, Lord, that we can be under it by divine inspiration of your Spirit to hear it. And that in our hearing, Lord, that your Spirit would say to those ears that are open that which you want to say. So, Lord, be in our hearts, be in our minds. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I thought it may be uh, timely to put for you uh, the title of a message that I think for the most part of the last uh, month and so has been indicative of our, 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 of our station and I know that it was printed in the bulletin. It was amazing. I, I thought that Betty was able to take and condense phone calls with Bernard or Dave into uh, small paragraphs. And, uh, and that's, that's a, a tribute to her. But I know that one of the first things that mentioned after the, uh, the call came on that Monday night, we had just arrived back from driving, just the short trip down south from here. And uh, we were eating our Wendy's dinner and the phone rang, and it was Bernard's dulcet tone on the other end, uh, calling us to Blind River. And uh, I remember hanging up with him, basically not giving him any kind of answer, uh, which was just, you know, for fun. <laughs> I needed to think, I needed to pray about it, and uh, I've already uh, received from a few people kind of relieved but surprised, looks like you, you came. Like as if you're all hiding something that I don't know about yet. <laughs> but I was pleased to feel the call of, uh, of Emmanuel and as well the Lord's Spirit leading us up here through many things, even, even so as to have chosen the home which we are still trying to uh, give a, a cute name to. We may call our home the manse or something like that. And, uh, and, and doing so to know that even it's time on the market and that it had dropped and different things in price and um, just the Lord's way that he has brought us here it has been a true testimony to his goodness despite our lack of faith at times but as we've cleaned up our house for its showing so that it would sell one thing that we left in the hallway was a sign very small just with old typewriter font on it that says pray trust and wait and so we claimed that for our journey and i shared that with bernard on the phone and so it made it into the bulletin and I thought as I come, as you've been on a journey of trusting and waiting and thankfully praying, that we would share that uh, as well this morning. Because it's been a while, I realize, since that uh, September Sunday to now. Uh, and I thank you for the diligence of the deacons and all of you as a congregation, not just for the two years, as it were, but even just in this time. Because there's nothing worse than kind of knowing, you know, that something's coming and and, and it's not quite there yet, and you're not even quite sure when it's coming. It's just coming. It's like your in-laws when they say they're coming at seven, and it's never really seven. You know that idea? Well, we know we've called him. We know he's accepted. When's he coming? He's coming. Christmas is coming too, but that's on a calendar. You know that. Jesus is coming. I arrived before him, sadly, but to trust and to wait has been difficult because we wanted to sell our house now. We wanted to buy that house now. We wanted to move up now. And this text came to me about partway through the month because I'm amazed at what Jesus does in his interaction with this woman there. So that's not me sitting and looking over. I think my hair would be sticking up in the back if that was me or... Or something like that. But I wanted you to get that idea of that's, that's been us. Praying and trusting and waiting. And this passage here that Jesus interacts with the Canaanite woman. And even just shortly with the uh, religious leaders and uh, his disciples. I thought was important. I want to predominantly look at this interaction with the Canaanite woman. And something that Jesus doesn't do is what I want us to look at. But I thought to give in context, 
this idea. Jesus is interacting with his disciples as they're wondering what's going on with the religious leaders. Just our midpoint of 15 there. He says to them, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted, right? Leave them alone. Don't worry about them. They're just hot wind. They're just blowing smoke. It's like they're blind and they're leading blind people. They're both going to trip and fall in a pit. What's the concern? Some of you already recognized just previously what it is. It's because they're eating without washing their hands. Horrible, horrible thing. According to the religious law, that's, you need to do that. They're getting caught up on all the details of the law. And Jesus is saying, let's not worry about that because I've come to fulfill the law entirely. And it's about the heart. It's what's inside that really matters. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is what defiles. He gives a few examples of defiling things that come from men's hearts and sometimes women's. And these are what defile a person. I think it's ideal. No part of Scripture is ever placed there for us just randomly. This is not chicken soup for the soul. This is God's holy word to you in the order that it comes. Why would the Canaanite woman's faith be talked about right after an interaction with the disciples concerning hand washing and defiled hearts? I think it's because this woman, who is not within the fold of Israel, which is indicative of the reason Christ gives some of the responses he does. This is one of those hard sayings of Christ that people look at and think, how could he be so mean to her? Why did he say that? He called her a dog, essentially, right? We're going to look at that. He said, woman, that's disrespectful, right? We're going to look at some of these things. But don't fail to remember the context in which this narrative comes is that it's right after talking about a heart. And Jesus acknowledges the heart. And overall, as we're considering that we would pray and that we would trust and that we would wait, that God sometimes have different timing than us. Jesus left that place, moved on, went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon, which is not Israel, as it were. This is Gentile territory. And then a Canaanite woman comes from that region and starts shouting to him, have mercy on me, Lord." son of David. She seems to know who he is, even though she's not within the fold, as it were. She seems to recognize him by his Israel title, the son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. I want to just for a moment to bring it home to us here. You can remove that maybe just a little bit, whatever you want to remove that my daughter is. Now, some of you may leave it the same. I understand that. <laughs> my daughter is tormented by whatever, right? But you may send something else. You have your own personal concern with which you want to confront Christ and bring to him in prayer. Bernard just stood here to say, let's, let's go as the people of God before him and let's pray. Are there any prayer requests? And no one said anything. So that's okay, but you're lying because there is something about which you want to boldly approach the eternal throne, to quote the hymn writer. What is it that you would ask God for? And in saying it, look at his response in verse 23, which is what I want us to consider. It's there, it's stuck in the middle. Maybe we don't look at it a whole lot, but I want us to consider this one verse. But he did not answer her at all. I like the older translation, sometimes the King James says, he answered her not but a word right? Didn't say anything. Not even talk to the hand or anything like that, right? Didn't even answer her. Just keeps going on. And then the disciples come and urge him saying, send her away. So he doesn't answer her. His disciples come along. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to stay here because I realize you're videotaping this, which is why you're not. Oh, okay. Thanks. Because I watched last time. I move a lot. So it's one thing to listen to me audibly, which is probably what you got before. I'm tangential. I apologize. Let's get back to this. I'm going to try to stand and smile. All right. His disciples come alongside and say, don't pay attention to her. She keeps shouting after us. She's annoying. Why is she? Don't, don't, does she not recognize that we have something that we're doing? Does she not recognize that we're on a mission? Does she not recognize that we, we've just left 
you know, a certain teaching opportunity here, and we're just traveling through your area. We're not really doing anything here. Go away. Then he answers, and yet it doesn't quite say to her, interestingly enough, but he answers this just out perhaps maybe walking and not even maybe looking at her. Something like you might do, your young child is just, you know, pulling mommy, 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 all those things, right, to do so, and you just kind of answer them, like, okay, yes, it's fine, go get a cup of what, whatever you say. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ooh, that stings, even more so. Now she's really been put in her place. But she comes and kneels before him saying, Lord, help me. Now he answers her. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> Again, denied, it seems. Now she comes up with this wonderful response that we all recognize in having read this passage before, this, this brilliant wit that she has, this, this turn of phrase. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So then Jesus answers her, woman, great is your faith, let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter then was healed next month. No, when? Instantly, she doesn't even really know it because she's there with Jesus. Clearly, she didn't necessarily, she didn't drag her daughter out. I don't know how well uh, demon-possessed daughters come alongside. So probably not with her. And yet instantly is she healed. Why? Because the faith of that individual was great. So just have faith. Is that what I'm saying? Is that what Christ is saying? No less than that, but more than that. Because faith is, in our culture, a very popular thing to have. I've met several girls named Faith. Um, people on the radio talk about Faith. And people who are not even... Well, we will refer to people sometimes of being of Faith. But I want to say to you today, just shortly after uh, the 31st of October, which was also Halloween, but was Reformation Day, and so... In the uh, words of the great reformer, it is by faith alone that we are rescued by Christ. Not so much in having that faith, but he who, in whom we've placed that faith. The object of our faith is what matters. And she is placing her faith, her trust, and her waiting is on Christ. This passage is a great example of the expansion of Jesus' ministry, even to those that are not the Jewish faith. He came to rescue all of his own, be that whatever tribe, color, tree, uh, tongue, anything. Even planting that seed first with Abraham, right? You will be the father of many nations, right? And then we read at the end of the book in Revelation about how great myriads upon myriads are going to be there from everyone and everywhere, right? So Jesus is part of that great plan, and this is an expansion of the ministry of the gospel of Christ into the non-Jewish people. And although Jesus makes clear to this non-Jewish woman that she is very non-Jewish, he came first as the shepherd of Israel, he says. He's calling to gather the sheep of God's people who were dispersed in exile because of sin. He nonetheless shows compassion to her and heals her daughter as she asks I mean, recognize this whole statement, right? Only to the lost sheep of Israel. Prior to the resurrection, this wall of hostility, uh, which we can read about in Ephesians 2, still stands, right? Jesus came as the Messiah and heir to the throne of David. And this woman recognized that. Jesus graciously responds only after it was clear that the woman had no presumption of deserving the blessing promised to Israel. Rather, she hopes to benefit from the overflow of those blessings, which were named for the world. She's claiming what's hers. She had every right to approach him that day. I think she obviously was very well-worded in how she approached it, but she doggedly did it. She came to him, I, pun intended, right? Doggedly did it, right? To, to pursue him. Please, heal. Please, help. Please, but Lord, oh, I know, you're, what you're saying is true. But even the dogs eat the crumbs, right? Like, I'm going to get that. He then shows the same compassion to 
the predominantly non-Jewish crowds in the regions east. So he goes on in this chapter to continue blessing the non-Jews, as it were. So this is a great vision of the inclusion of God's saving purposes of all kinds of people. I think many of us here are probably Gentile in bed, right? And so we're thankful for the extension of God's kingdom outside. And this woman recognized it, called him by name, and claimed what was hers, trusting in the one that is worthy of trust, despite his lack of response. I mean, here's what I wanted to look at, right? Verse 23, the fact that he said nothing. He didn't even give her an answer. And the answers he gave her were somewhat negative. Maybe today you have that request, the one I was asking you to bring to mind. Maybe you have that request, Lord, please help me. My son or daughter, my children are wrestling with something. My work situation, my insert request there. And the Savior did not immediately bestow the blessing to her, even though the woman had great faith in him. And she showed herself to have it. And he intended to give it, but he waited a while. He didn't answer her even a word. And maybe if that's you at times, and you wonder, God, where are you? I'm praying to you. In fact, I've been praying to you for some time about this one issue. It is, it is difficult. I had a brief conversation with Malisha a while ago. It's difficult to keep praying for things like this, even despite the wonders of modern medicine, which make possible such things as esophagy, um, to do the surgery that's necessary, and places like uh, sick kids. But that's long. That's long to keep waiting, and especially have it to be postponed, which I knew because it was supposed to be October 30th or something like that. Another month. Patty, good to see you here. I joked about you last time. I'm speaking a little slower. Um, you're welcome. But to pray for continued healing. The refugee families. It was wonderful yesterday. I was doing the Blind River thing. I went to the Christmas fair. And I was amazed already. I've been here, what, three times? And already I run in the door and I meet like seven people who know me. <laughs> welcome to Blind River, right? But just to see everybody doing those things, and yet uh, the Raddens were uh, raising funds through their own personal efforts on this to, to, send, uh, to help bring a, a refugee family in, right? But to wait, to be waiting for that, to be that family that's looking, looking forward to it, right? All these requests here, these are all people that are waiting and trusting and praying for God to move. And sometimes it may feel as if they're not getting an answer. And maybe the answer that they're receiving they're not liking, or it doesn't sound very nice. Was this woman praying poorly? Were her prayers no good? No, actually she had very good prayer. We don't know how she was, what, what her prayer closet, as it were, was like. How afraid, well no, she wouldn't have had a prayer shell, forgive me, that was because she's a Gentile. But the idea of she would have been fervently praying. Was she not needy? Dreadfully needy. Maybe she didn't feel her need sufficiently. Actually, very overwhelmingly would she have felt it. Maybe, you know, maybe she wasn't sincere enough. Maybe that's the problem. No, she was intensely so. Did she not really have faith? Did she just not believe enough? She had such a high degree of it that even Jesus wondered and said, Woman, great is your faith. He didn't even say that to Peter, who hung around with him all the time. What is Jesus' words to Peter when he falls in the water? Oh, you have little faith, right? Why did you doubt? So it is, is it the amount of faith? Did she not have enough? I mean, if it only takes a mustard seed, I appreciated um, somebody just recently posted. Oh, it was Miss Alloway posted on her Facebook, I have a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it, right? That idea, like, I'm, I'm going to trust, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe, right? Even just the size of a mustard seed, uh, is Christ says, could make this tree to grow where the birds nest in it, right? Is it not enough faith? Oh, great is your faith. I'm also amazed. This is just a bonus. I'll throw this in here. Like in, in passages like Luke 7, where it's a centurion who has great faith. Jesus constantly finds great faith in people who are not in the house of Israel. 
I'm just amazed at that. He always makes examples of the people of, who are not of Israel that have tremendous faith and yet are not given all the signs necessarily that Israel are. And in a way, we kind of align ourselves there with Israel at times. I think we have so much blessing and promise and we fail at times to continue to trust in the goodness of our God despite the wonderful things that he has done in our life, despite all of the, um, the truth in the footprints poem that we would have, right? God, God, where are you in these times, right? Not recognize that it is he who holds us. Notice then here that although, although um, it is true that faith brings peace, it does not always bring it instantly. There may be certain reasons for faith to be tested rather than rewarded. Genuine faith may be in the soul like a hidden seed, but so far it may not have budded and blossomed into joy and peace yet. Silence from our Savior is the painful trial of many a seeking person. But heavy still is that affliction of a harsh cutting reply, like it's not right to take the children's bread. A deep sense of sin may have been given to us instead of a sense of pardon. And in such a case, we will need the patience to bear that heavy blow, but then to take the conviction of that Holy Spirit and to turn to God in repentance and in faith, and to then continue stepping on. Because perhaps the, the failure of your prayers, as it were, to come true or to be answered the way you want is, is due to a conviction that the Spirit is laying on you. But many in waiting upon the Lord find immediate delight. Uh, this is not always the case with everyone, but some, like the Philippian jailer, are in a moment turned from darkness to light, but others are plants of a slower growth. C.S. Lewis writes, in the voyage of the dawn treader at one point when they're going through the tumult of the dark waters in the, the dark place they're trying to receive uh rescue in it while the sea serpent is coming there's a there's an albatross that flies through and speaks lucy hears on the boat courage dear heart and so the lord speaks that to you this morning courage dear heart though christ beat and bruise you even or slay you you must trust him. Even if he should give to you an angry sounding word, believe in the love of his heart. You are urged not to give up seeking or trusting the Lord because you've not yet obtained the conscious joy that you long for. Cast yourself upon him and perse perseveringly depend upon him, even when you can't rejoice in hope right then. It is difficult to wait but the Lord is faithful and he wants to respond. And he has been there many, many times to give us the good that we don't deserve. And like the Israelites, who we like to kind of scoff at sometimes, how could they have seen the hand of God in their life like this? How could he have moved so strong and then forget it? Are we not at times just like them? So take the challenge this morning that we need to continue to pray and trust and wait for whatever it is that you're seeking the Lord, for whatever it is, whether it be moving or other things that we've had. Indeed, I pray that for all of us, that we would have that motivation, that, that kind of uh, direction in our life, that in all things we are praying and trusting and waiting, ensuring that the trust we have is placed in the only one worthy of all of our trust and faith, and that is Jesus Christ the Lord, who is the promise keeper forever and ever. Amen. As we move to the table uh, this morning, I think it is apt that we would consider this. Because maybe we're weary. Maybe we're uh, held down a little bit by some of those failures in our own life that we have not uh, given the Lord his due, as it were. That we have not trusted in him fully. And so I want to uh, lead us in this time now around the table. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. For our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We say that we will confess our transgression to God and he will forgive the iniquity in our soul. Almighty God, let us pray uh, to him now together. Mighty God, our maker and our redeemer, we as poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you. By thought, by word, by action, 
Wherefore, now we flee for safety to your infinite grace and mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Christ. Merciful God, who has given your only Son to die for us, have mercy on us, and for his sake grant to us the remission of all our sin by your Holy Spirit. Increase in us true knowledge of you and your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Christ our Lord. Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us our sin. And to those who believe on his name, he gives the right to become children of God and has promised to us his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant this all in our hearts today. Amen. Let us consider life as an Israelite as we come to the table this morning. Just a brief reading from uh, the book of Exodus. Moses said, call all of the elders together and say, select lambs for yourselves according to your families. Kill the Passover lamb. Take then a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood which is in the basin. And none of you then shall go out of the door of this house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to slay the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and you will not, he will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to slay you. And fast forwarding. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples and he looked up at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ has come to be our Lamb. He has come to give us life through his death. And it is in his death that we find freedom, true relief, peace, all that we are searching for. If you are here this morning and you do not know Christ as both your Lord and your Savior, then we would ask uh, that you would find him this morning as you feel his spirit stirring in you and that you would not harden your hearts but respond to him. For this table is ultimately a table for sinners in that we all fall short of God's glory. But those that have claimed the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ are welcome to come and to enjoy fellowship with him through the bread and the wine. And so I want to just pray uh, for each element and the stewards this morning will come forward uh, to help to uh, spread them about the congregation. We'll pray first for the bread and then uh, secondly, after taking it, we will pray then for the wine and distribute it. So let us pray for the bread this morning. Father, we thank you for this bread which herein represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on that night when he was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And so in that same spirit, we pray that, Lord, we would take it all and eat of it so that we would join in your sufferings and in your death. Lord, we trust you and we are waiting on you and we thank you that as we eat this bread this morning, we do so as a foretaste of that which is to come when we eat it anew with you in the kingdom. And so we pray a blessing upon each partaker this morning. And that it would nourish us in heart and soul. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. If I could ask the stewards to come this morning. Oh, 
body of our Lord, take all of you and eat it. On that same night, after having broken the bread, he took the cup and he said, this now is my blood shed for the remission of sins and in the new covenant. And so we take as well the fruit of the vine this morning, remembering that it took his life so as to rescue ours. And so let us pray for the cup. Father, we ask more of your grace to us. We ask for an increased measure of faith in us. We thank you for the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Knowing that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Father, we ask forgiveness for those words and for those actions and thoughts that we have committed that are contrary to your heart and contrary to your command. Because you love us, you sent your Son to die for us. And so wash us in this blood so that as the Father looks upon us, he sees you, O Christ. We thank you for the blood. We thank you that we now drink in remembrance of it. Now until kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let 
blood of Christ. Drink ye all of it. It was good to hear um, this young lady chuckle in the midst of what's often seemingly a somber thing. But I appreciate that. Because let's not have heavy hearts. And as we sing even now our closing song, that's the spirit in which I think Christ has come and to give us to enjoy this table, is that we are free. We are free indeed. Our sin may make us somber and sad. Indeed, it break his very heart that he would have to send his son to die for it. He does not take your sin lightly, but it is free. And in Christ, you are free. And if you've come to him this morning, indeed, you are free. And so celebrate that. Feel free to laugh. It's okay. I know you're Baptists, but. <laughs> so let's stand and sing our uh, closing song. <laughs>